welcome everyone to 52 Living Ideas. My name is Evanique and I am co-moderating with uh, my partner, Brian, today. Uh, today we're going to present, this, we're going to start the series, The Sacred Feminine. Um, and we're going to go into the first goddess, which is Isis. Uh, so what's going to happen tonight is that I'm going to provide uh, a bit of the background and the framework. And then Brian is going to talk about the goddess Isis, and then I will come in with additional thoughts. Um, so after I talk about the framework, I will stop and ask if anybody has any questions or any comments before Brian moves into Isis. And um, and the reason why I'm just setting up the framework, because I think it's important. I want to focus everybody attention on the story of Isis and I'm going to set up, you know, how did this come about and um, why are we studying this? Like, why do we want to study the divine feminine? So I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one second. So can everybody see my screen? Brian, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh. Sorry, guys, just give me one second. Sorry, guys, it's on two screens. So I'm just gonna move it back to my PC screen. Apologies. Okay, so. You can just click on the display settings, the down arrow on the display settings, and there is a selection there. Uh, go to the duplicate size slideshow maybe. Hmm. Okay, sorry. Um... Is everybody okay with viewing it in this way? Can everybody see it? I'm sorry that it's not working properly. Yep, that's good. Okay. So this is the Divine Feminine series. This is based on the book, uh, Goddess Power by Isabella Price. And um, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so I, I just wanted to give the introduction uh, so in this introduction, we're going to talk about uh, integral theory, incorporating myth into integral theory, the divine feminine itself, and go over really quickly what religions will be studying. And so I'll begin. So with integral theory, um, it acknowledges all of the wisdom of all of the traditions. And that's going to go into like, uh, you know, we're going to study basically the five basic religions of Hinduism, uh, Christianity, um, Jewish tradition, um, a little bit of Islam and um, Jewish mysticism. And, you know, other religions and other cultures are gonna be in like Isis is obviously of Egyptian origin. And so we're gonna be incorporating a lot of other things in. I just wanted to kind of give an overview of that. Um, when we talk about this through the series, we're going to talk about the psychology, the physics, and the biology of it. Um, you'll see tonight as we talk about ISIS, we're going to talk about, you know, um, the psychology of ISIS and why we study ISIS. And, you know, we're going to be asking you guys questions uh, to, to show what you're going to get from it. So the book itself, uh, Goddess Power, looks at it in three ways. Goddess Self is the great I, which is the first person. Um, in Christianity, we refer to it as God the Father, but obviously since we're studying the divine feminine, it's just um, God as a persona. Like they talk, like sometimes the gods and goddesses are really like people in a sense in that they have their own identity, they have feelings, they have, um, you know, they, they love, they show anger. So it, in a sense, these goddesses are a lot like us as, as, as human beings. And it'll be apparent as to why a little later, but just to give a little introduction, 
the the reason why is because you know some of these stories were created by human beings and passed down by human beings so obviously they will have the qualities of us uh the second part of the god is the god is the great thou or holy other which is like the second person uh you could relate that and i'm sorry christianity is just my background so i just it's just easier for me to think of it this way is god the son and um you know, they're all together and they're all one, but at the same time, you know, I, I hate to use hierarchy, but um, God the Son is, is the second person and not, you know, if you looked at it as a hierarchy, it would be like God the Father, God the Son, and then the third God is God as the great, it, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the ground of being or the great web of life they all have different parts to play and so for me this this whole thing just interested me so as we are studying the goddesses we're going to look at it as these three things and so that's how that's a basic summary of integral theory um the next thing i want to talk about is the divine feminine and masculine both feminine and masculine are within us. And it's not a gender thing. And that's what I want to express. Um, these are just qualities that for some reason got classified this way. And if I'm honest, I don't like the classification of feminine and masculine, but it's the best way that we have to, de to describe it. And when I did the research, that's how every speaker everybody that talks about this topic talks about it. And I just think because it, especially in Western society, we kind of still see the feminine as um, inferior to the masculine in general. That's why I don't like to use it because it seems like one is better than the other. And I don't think one is better than the other, but we're gonna go into the next slide and so when we talk about the divine masculine and the divine feminine, these are the qualities that you'll see if someone is like dominant in their masculine energy, this is what you'll see. So in a divine masculine, it'll be, they're basically logical, cognition, spirit, singular focused structure and action. And those are great qualities. They're the planners, right? They get things done. Well, actually there's their planners and their executors. If you need to plan escalate, you execute it, you need a masculine energy to get that done because of these qualities. Now, obviously, you know, there's, there's females that are, that are great at logic great at cognition, they recognize the spirit, you know, they can focus on one thing and get it done into completion. I have friends like this that are females and they're great at it. That's why we depend on them for planning things because we know they're going to get everything done. Now, going over to the divine feminine, there's intuition, emotion, they focus on the body. Like, and when I say the body, I mean like, like physically what's going on in the body, like how they feel in their body. Um, you know, they're more aware of the body mind connection or the body spirit connection. Um, and then there's the wide focus. So they see like the big picture, like, you know, they, if you look over it where the masculine has a singular focus and the feminine has a wider focus, the feminine qualities can see the big picture. They can look at something and see how it's gonna go through till the end, right? And they can see how it's gonna affect other people. They're concerned about that. They're concerned about how it's gonna help other people. They are concerned about how this decision that they're making is gonna affect everyone. You know, whether it's a decision of um, a decision about family and how the families run, or, you know, the medical decisions or whatever decision needs to be made, they're looking at it as, how is it going to affect the community as a whole? How is it going to affect the family as a whole? How is it going to affect the group? And whereas the divine masculine structure, uh, feminine is fluidity. So I think with the female quality, there's um, 
you know, they're not so stringent on the plants. They're flexible, they're fluid. They can, if something goes wrong, a, a feminine, a person with this quality is able to adapt quicker. They can, you know, refocus their energy on the change and, you know, still just get the thing done. Whereas, you know, a masculine person is still focused on the structure and it's harder for someone with that masculine energy to adapt. And as an action, and then there's a rest, right? And and I think we could see, especially with this last one, um, with Western culture in general, like you can see where it leans more masculine in this aspect, um, because when we we need rest, and so you know, Western culture is the hustle culture, um, you know, in general, like you know, hustle, 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 get it done. You don't need sleep. You know, we always hear the saying, "Sleep when you're dead." Oh, you know, you just get this one more thing done. We can even see it in today's society. Like even when we were working from home in 2020 and 2021, we weren't taking like time off to just goof around. No, we were like working those hours. So we we looked at his commute time. Oh, we could still work, and so that's. Definitely, and, and there's room for that and there's nothing wrong with that, but it has to be a balance. And I think if you looked at this as a whole, you can see if you incorporated both qualities and you respect both of these qualities and both of these energies in the masculine and the feminine, you see the balance. And I think that's the beauty of studying both. And I think that's why it's so important to study both. And even with like looking at Isis, um, you know, the Isis story obviously involves Osiris, right? And that's like a masculine energy, but you'll see throughout when we discuss Isis that she has qualities of both. And I think that's the beauty of this series is that we're gonna show not only the feminine qualities of Isis, we're gonna show the masculine qualities of Isis. And we're gonna show that these feminine goddesses have qualities of both. and why that is such a good balance. Um, so moving on. Next thing I want to talk about is myth. And you know, myth is the ability is a story. It's basically a story that gets told over and over again. And it goes throughout cultures, it travels. Um, and yes, even though it is a story, it has a good point. And the reason why we tell stories, uh, when we did the Bible series with Jordan Peterson, um, well, not with Jordan Peterson, but, you know, Jordan Peterson series on the Bible stories, um, the reason why we did that, and he talks about stories, and he says, stories stick with people. And I think that's why we tell these stories of these goddesses and gods. They stick with people, and they bring home a point. And you could go with facts and figures and you know, be rigid like that and say, you know, well, factually, did this happen or not? I would venture to say to open your mind and think about it as if it didn't matter. And the reason why I'm asking the audience to do this tonight is because the story has a point to bring across and it, you can relate more to a story and you can remember stories quicker than you can remember facts or figures. Uh, so that's why it was told. Um, so when we look at myth, you know, it's the eye. It's the instrument of perception. So when someone is telling a really great story, think about a really great story that you've been told. You, you can, as the person's telling the story, you can visualize where they are. You can visualize what, what the places is, what the colors are. You can uh, know what the characters look like. You have an idea in your mind of what the characters look like. So you're perceiving all of these things through your eye based off of your experiences. So you're bringing yourself to this story, which is why you remember it so well. You can bring yourself to the story and you can visualize it. And then another way to look at, at a myth is a window and it you can see through the story. And so what are you seeing, right? It depends. It depends on what do you what is the person who's telling you the story trying to convey. Um, so, like you know, in ISIS, it's trying to convey the story of family, the story of betrayal, the story of jealousy, um, 
and the story also of reconciliation. You'll see that throughout the story. So, you know, looking at it through the window of like seeing through the story and figuring out what they're trying to tell you. And then it's a mirror. And this is what I want you guys to really like focus. I want you to focus on all these things. But the mirror, I think, is the most important. You might disagree, and that's fine. Um, but it's ultimately uh, how you see yourself. Sorry, I made a typo. You do see yourself. Ultimately, you see yourself in the story. So when Brian is talking about ISIS, just think about where do you see yourself in that story? Like, how can you relate to this story or this myth? What lessons can you take away from this story? Because it is really an interesting and beautiful story. So now Brian's going to go into ISIS. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. Before we do that, sorry, Brian, I already forgot. Any questions or comments? If you have questions or comments, you can type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. So if you've gotten anything or if you have any questions or just anything, uh, you can type exclamation point in Zoom or raise your hand. I mean, type, type exclamation point in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Can I say a couple things? Absolutely. Just to kick kick things off, the um, oh Penny, could you close the? Is there a door to close? Yeah. All right. The um, first of all, I want to say that that I was uh, inspired to encourage this series and to participate in it, based on what uh, um, Evanique had done with Mary Magdalene. It's, um, I've read a lot of mythology, religion over the years, really for decades, and have run across, you know, obviously regular references to uh, the feminine in my reading, but uh, often it was just incidental to the a broader story, especially in, you know, in my Western reading. And the, um, I thought that, that was kind of a shame. I thought uh, there really is something there which we're missing. So um, Evany put this out and I thought with Mary Magdalene, she did a great job in highlighting what, what Mary Magdalene's story could add to the gospel uh, in early Christianity. Um, and it was just obvious to me from all my other readings that focusing on the feminine, which isn't done much, uh, really could add a lot to uh, our understanding of ourselves, the world around us, and other people, uh, exactly as is flagged by that uh, into integral theory. Now, the integral theory that she touched on that is mentioned by uh, this book, Isabella, Isabella Price, but it's just one framework for understanding you know, mythology or goddesses, religions or philosophy for understanding life. It's just one framework. And the, um, I liked it. I've read, I read several books on the feminine to prep for this series. And that one seemed like the best because it was the most, uh, this integral theory is the most open-ended. Uh, but I don't think we really need to, uh, we're not trying to apply, and at least in my estimation we're not trying to apply the integral theory what i'm personally what i'm very interested in is just how you react to these myths because uh that's what's been so critical to me um just developing a, a, an appreciation for the feminine role the uh in all of these different mythologies and religions and some gratitude for uh, the role that has been characterized as the feminine, and I think often overlooked. The um, and I think also now we're going to be telling the stories out of this book here. The um, again, I've read a lot of mythologies. These stories go way, way, way back, thousands of years, and it is hard to find a single version of any of these mythologies. 
And some of you are probably coming into these uh, under, into this meeting with your having read your own versions. And I'm sure they're all valid. And if, if you have additional facts you want to bring up out of your versions, that's great. But I think we need to have a, a kind of an agreed basis for moving forward. And again, having read this book, I found that this one had the best approach to the stories. It wasn't parochial. The, she didn't edit the stories to try to make a point. I, I just thought it was uh, really good uh, renditions of these stories. So I, that's what I'm gonna be relying on. Um, Evanique mentioned the religions we're studying. Yes, uh, we'll take the first of all, I think the ones that are in this book, they're not all the religions she flagged. For example, I think the next one to do is from Africa. There's an ocean who's just an amazing goddess from Africa. Um, but there's also, and I'll just say there's the Paleolithic, there's the Sumerian, the Akkadian. These, there are amazing uh, stories about the feminine divine in the uh, Akkadian Sumerian myths that go way, way back. These are some of the very first myths ever written. The, um, also, we could focus on the Persian or the, and even in the East, the, uh, let's you know call it the vedic or the hindu and the taoist that those are interesting because you get away from the disembodied anthropomorphized feminine and more into a, a i guess an abstract understanding of those things the um which i think is is useful just as she uh Evanique flagged it's i guess um you know, at the end of her discussion of the characteristics, I think is the what are, what are considered at the moment masculine and feminine. Those are uh, those are great lists. I th and I think that they're absolutely true. Um, in you know, let's say recent past, maybe the past hundred years, thousand years, whatever. The um, but it's not the only way to break up the feminine and and. Uh, masculine qualities and honestly that is really brought out when you look back at these other myths like the Phoenician role of the feminine or the Sumerian those are you get a completely different view of what the feminine is so it just strikes me as she said that at the end of the at the end of the day it's really about balance and uh, understanding that the masculine and feminine complement each other and without uh, thinking about the feminine, or, or let's say just focusing more exclusively on the masculine, you really are not getting a complete picture of yourself, others, or life in general. Uh, so it's, that's really where I'm coming from. So we would all benefit from doing that. The, uh, but I like the last thing she said, uh, the myths as windows and mirrors. I think that's that's going to be great. So uh, I wanted to I wanted to squeeze that in before anybody else gave comment. But I one thing I'm really interested in is what where do you stand on the divine feminine right now, and what do you hope to get out of this uh, discussion today, and hopefully going forward? Thank you, Brian, um, and. You're right, I absolutely agree. Like we need to add all of the things that you just said into it. So um, thank you. Uh, so up first we have Dave Dinamore followed by Joe. Yeah, thanks Evanique. Uh, great presentation so far. I want to comment on the masculine and feminine uh, and the, the uh, characteristics that were listed on the slide. And you know, naturally they're exact opposites. And what comes to my mind is the sing symbol of yin and yang, you know, the black and white uh, intersecting with each other, that uh, there's a white dot in the black and the black dot in the white, that uh, a healthy man has some female characteristics, a healthy woman has some male characteristics, that uh, I had think of it as just identifying the characteristics this way, that a woman can be analytical and still be a good person this that and the other it's just that they're just educate 
identified as these type or uh, analyticals is identified as a male trait, but it doesn't mean it can't be the other way. Uh, it's just, uh, but uh, it's, I think it's just healthy to uh, say we can, we can really be anything we want to be. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, all great points. And I agree. I love the part that you said about the yin and yang. I know Sheree Khan at one time talked about that in one of his presentations. And it, it's true. And I, and I think that's a great way of describing it is that, you know, a healthy and whole person it not only has those qualities, but isn't afraid to express those qualities. You know, they're not identifying them as somehow inferior or superior, that they can express those qualities that they have and, and be a whole person expressing who they are and who they're created to be. I mean, obviously in each person, there's some things that dominate sometimes in some people the feminine dominates and some people, the masculine dominates, but it's the balance and the respect for both, I think is key to making the whole person. So thank you. Up next, we have Joe. Uh, thank you, uh, Evanique and, and Brian, both for your comments. I mean, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm excited about this series. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see, you know, some of the traits that you'd already outlined, but I, I want to see also, it'll be interesting to explore how the feminine actually uh, is, is revered in different belief systems uh, and how that actually plays out in culture itself. Um, I think that that's going to be an interesting thing to explore. I actually just got the book myself. I also, you know, think it would be interesting to explore some of the things that uh, Jordan Peterson had talked about when he talked about the feminine, uh, and uh, and specifically um, uh, how uh, the feminine tames the masculine, uh, and and in a sense how they work together uh, in order to. Uh, you know, to uh, that and how the hero's journey actually fits within that framework, even within the feminine, because the hero's journey is, uh, a journey is often associated with uh, the masculine, but there's also a hero's journey for the feminine as well, uh, where there are things like wisdom, you know, knowledge uh, that are the rewards uh, um, by confronting the unknown. Uh, so I, I think that this, I, I think this has a lot of, it, it, I'm, I'm interested again to see the, how this also plays out within different cultures as, you know, how this manifests itself in culture as well, even with us today. Uh, I think I, I believe, you know, the United States are in particular, you know, it tends to be more of a masculine culture. Uh, so, and, and so just to see how that, uh, you know, would, uh, how that actually impacts our everyday life. Um, so those are just some, some of my thoughts, but I'm excited too. about the series. I would just like to chime in and say that uh, already I'm getting a lot out of this because with David's comment and Evanique's response, it became clear to me that one of the benefits of this series is that uh, people you know, not just women, men and women who want to express themselves out of the divine feminine will feel validated in doing that. They'll feel validated if they come across as intuitive instead of logical or uh, seeing the whole picture instead of the focus point. All of these, uh, all of these um, qualities that Evanique flagged. So I think already we should feel this maybe will help people feel emboldened to, as she said, to express the feminine. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Joe. And Joe, um, I just, I, I like the part about, you know, Jordan Peterson saying that the feminine tames the masculine. I think that's something that is worthy to explore. Um, and there was something else she said, um, you know, about the hero, well, the hero's journey for the feminine, or that we could just call it the heroine's journey. I think that's, that'll be an interesting to point to bring up in future discussions of the goddesses and, you know, 
looking at, you know, in the ways of how they are the hero. And I just invite everyone to look at, even tonight in the ISIS story, see if you can see, if you know about the hero's journey or see if you can see the hero's journey in the story of ISIS. So thank you both. Um, so up next we have Sheree Kant, followed by Lori, Laura and Allison. Sheree Kant. Thank you. Thank you, Evanik. Um, so answering Brian's question, I'm very excited about this series because the Western culture, especially the modern Western culture, is heavily uh, masculine. It has moved that way, especially after the printing revolution. It has moved that way even more. And you can see that in the distinction between, say, Protestant versus Catholic. You can see the reduction of the role of Mary in, in, the, in the church. So there are many, many ways in which this happens in the, uh, in the religion. And it certainly happens a lot in the intellectual culture as such. So this is a crucial antidote to that. And it is all about yin and yang, because I think both, you know, we, we are human beings. We need, you know, we need both for 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 mankind to survive and to thrive so it's uh, and that balance is crucial and hopefully this series will play a part in restoring that balance at least for us thank you thank you shurika i think there's some really great points is that is especially looking at uh religion in terms of the christianity and and seeing and the point that you brought up about the printing press, I think it's key because, you know, that's where you see the stories in print and that's where, you know, it, the masculine dominated Bible, I will say, it got printed. And so that's what everybody read and everybody remembered. And that's part of how uh, the sacred feminine kind of, you know, got looked at as, you know, as somehow being weak. I, and, you know, we're going to talk about that as well. So thank you. Um, up next, I have uh, Laura followed by Allison. And if anyone else wants to comment or, you know, we would love to hear what you want to get out of this series, you can type exclamation point in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Ready for me? Yep. Um, I don't know. It's maybe strange, but and maybe it's because they're documentaries. I don't know. But in a lot of these, you find that the queen has a lot of influence over the king, although he's running, you know, it, the masculine side actually is the prominent one. But the queen quietly, he turns to the queen quite a bit, although her role is never, you know, viewed with great importance. And I've seen it many times. So, um, and I agree with, with the advent of the church and religion, all of this has become more masculine white woman is more subservient in general in every one of these cases. But at the same time, I think in the um, in the reign of various kings and uh, they, that they have sought the counsel of their wives because they're, you know, they have that very special thing to offer. And, you know, the Internally in the house, the wives are considered very important, very of great strength. That will come out here also in the story of ISIS, I think, in two aspects. Uh, number one, and I'll mention it again when we do it, uh, all of the, all the characteristics and qualities that ISIS has, her husband also has. She's the queen, he's the king. And they both have the same qualities. There's no, they're both complete. They're not complementary. They're both complete. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and so they're equal partners. It's really a fascinating, a fascinating difference there. The, um, and then she's instrumental also in providing for the succession of the, the king father Osiris to the king's son Horus. 
So she plays a very important role there as well. Yeah. Also, when you look at it, I mean, when Victoria took up the throne, I mean, she wasn't necessarily born to be, you know, the only potential, you know, person to take the throne. When Elizabeth would take the throne, I mean, these people weren't, you know, these women took on the role of great power, but they weren't necessarily deemed in a way at birth that they were going to to have those qualities, those masculine qualities that are necessary, but somehow they managed to, you know, find in them and brought them out, I guess would be the best way to say it. So, and the men in their lives were subservient to a degree, but they also took the counsel of their husbands in many cases, depending on the nature of the situation. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, Laura, that's a good point about, um, you know, the husbands, list, like the kings listening to their queens. And I think what you see is two things. You see the balance, right, uh, that we talked about earlier, you know, the recognition and the respect of when the husband takes the advice of the wife, even though he is the king and he's the ruler of the land, in a lot of ways, the queen can influence him because he recognizes what she brings to the table. And I think that's that part is very beautiful in seeing that influence and you can see the balance there. And you see it in different texts too. Like um, in the Bible, for instance, the one thing that, piped, that popped up for me was the story of Abigail, David, and I forget Abigail's first husband, but he was not wise and he would not listen to her. You know, David was asking for help and he didn't want to give it. And, you know, she recognized who David is and she had the wisdom to bring what David needed to him. And David took her on as a wife because he recognized, um, you know, her wisdom. So, and uh, you're right, through all the, like through all the different religions, you could see the wisdom. And I think even in masculine dominated books like the Bible, it shows the wisdom of listening to wise women. And I think, you know, in the story of the Bible, wisdom is a woman. So, you know, even then you'll see the balance. And I think that's very interesting, something to think about. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, Laura, you wanted to say something? Uh, Laura, you're on mute. Aren't all these traits, you know, inherent in both people? I mean, don't they come that way in, in so in some sense equal to begin with? Yeah, there's definitely those masculine and feminine qualities in both people. And, you know, like I said before, some exhibit more, some people exhibit more masculine qualities and some people exhibit more feminine qualities. And, but it's the balance because we need both to have a truly balanced society and world. But the, how it come, it depends on who's teaching them, which qualities come out. Matter, yeah. There's a little more feminine. Yeah, we'll have to look at that. I guess it's learned, I would say. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm interested to know if it is or not learned. Thank you. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> Gave me a lot of time. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Up next, I have Allison followed by Penny. Um, I just want to really thank you for doing this, especially right at this moment in time, because I think that a lot of American women right now feel that the feminine contributions aren't really valued. And it's kind of like a big moral, uh, I, I don't know, it's very, very defeating. And so when I saw that you'd posted this, I was really, really glad because I think it's important to know the history of this and know, um, you know, really to celebrate this because the real thing is we, we need both qualities. And it really is true that not, um, you know, I, I know women who have every one of those masculine characteristics and I have met, know men who have every one of the, the feminine, but I feel like lots of times we're really, we're socialized to be one way or the other. And I know they've done studies on women who've gone to all female colleges and because there aren't men there, they take on leadership roles in a way that they don't in a regular, in a co-ed school. 
And then they go on, they've tracked them over the years and they were wound up being more successful down the road just because they felt like they could take on those roles. But, uh, but I feel like they're all important, really. You know, like intuition is something that is really not respected very much in this country. You know, a lot of the things on the feminine side aren't just, you know, they're not really respected that much, but yet they're so important, you know? And so I think, um, I just want to thank you for doing this. I think it's really um, a great time, especially to be doing this. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate that, Allison, um, and you're welcome. And you bring up some really good points about, you know, and especially the point about the um, the women who attended all female schools that felt like they could take on um, leadership and like qualities that are seemingly masculine and not even think anything of it because you know no one told them that they couldn't, right? And you know they're in a an environment with other women that encourage that. And so, um, and, and I think too, um, you know, like you said, it, it, it all like what, like you said, or like what everybody else says is that both is needed. And we, and, and that's the, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. And I'm so glad that Brian partnered with me on this because I think I, I know I need that masculine balance too that Brian brings in, you know, Brian's the one that suggested the book, The Goddess Power. And so, in it, you know, when I read it, I was like, this is great. And, you know, I wouldn't have thought about that book in this series if Brian hadn't brought that to the table. So, you know, recognizing So thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and also it's true, like, especially not just with Kings and Queens, but I think in any good relationship between men and women they're going to respect each other's ideas and they bounce off of each other and they they become better because they're they're feeding off of each other and and pushing each other out of their comfort level and um so it's not just kings and queens really you know i mean i've seen it with family members that you know been married for many many years so Oh yeah, Thank I think you. well, kings and queens are like gods and goddesses. They're just, you know, in some ways they're just exemplars. You know, it used to be people thought that's the only only uh, life worth focusing on was the the celebrity or the wealthy, and but now it's uh, you know what the things we observed about those elites, I think, are true in general. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. I want to, uh, I want to comment on oh, what Joe said, if I may. I'm, Absolutely, I'm, not I'm sorry. So, I'm not always so quick on at the trigger, but you know, Joe was talking about the difference, you know, about being interested in exploring the hero, hero's journey from a feminine perspective, or the hero and heroine journeys. And I'll just point out that might they might be very different. The um, just the, there are a few things uh, that have come out of feminist psychology, I think, or that would illustrate this. The, uh, you know, the general approach, it felt like whenever you, it, the, the old orthodox approach to a threat in psychology was the human response. The human response is fight or flight, fight or flight. And the uh, feminist psychologist studied this not just in uh, humans, but other primary uh, primates and the uh, and mammals, and the response uh, of women or the female is uh, tend and mend. If you're confronted with a threat, if a woman is confronted with a threat, she would try to tend and mend uh, to avoid or repair damage, whereas the men would fight or flight. <laughs> So the typical uh, human response was really the masculine response. And the other thing is the, um, or a couple more, one is uh, the men tend to think in terms of uh, relationships, or excuse me, transactions and women in terms of relationships, just as, so it's really the focused versus the broad based and that's been established. 
by psychologists. And also the uh, men tend to think more in universal uh, principles and women are more situation oriented in terms of their ethics. So uh, for all those reasons, I think of the, the heroine journey, I think could be very different from the, the hero journey. I, don't, I hadn't really thought about it, but I'll bet when we, as we explore it, we'll see that there are real differences. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to exploring that. That was one thing I didn't think of. I, I think we definitely need to focus on that because I want to learn more about that too. Uh, and I think the the thing I like what you said is that women tend to tend and mend, and women and men do the flight or flight. I think that's something to explore throughout these uh, when studying these goddesses. Like, how do they deal with conflict? Because one of the things is that you know, the in a goddess's stories and all of them, there is some type of conflict or some type of war. Um, I, I think that's, it's, it'll be interesting to see how they deal with it. And maybe we can talk about the hero, heroine journey in that as well. Uh, so, oh, did you want to say something else, Brian? I'm sorry. No. I'm done. So up next, I have Penny followed by Laura. Hi. Um, well, I think this is a, you know, a great series. I've been reading some books. And one of the things that I hope that we, we talk about some in it is, you know, in the history, um, like prehistoric times, Neolithic times, the great goddess was really the predominant goddess in society. And then um, with the Iron Age and tools, um, people became more warlike. And so the men had the physical strength. And so they were able to become the dominant force in society as opposed to the women who weren't as strong. And so I think, uh, you know, over time, inequality that they considered, you know, that men, since they were in charge, you know, they, they felt like they had the best qualities and those were the masculine qualities whereas feminine qualities were were you know lesser and not the predominant ones but i think in early history it appears that both both sexes were much more even and uh, women had dominant roles and they played readership roles and they were you know in charge of religious activities and scribes and you know lots of innovation and i just think it's kind of important to to bring up kind of the the history of you know why um the the divine feminine kind of disappeared and why women are considered and their qualities which are just human qualities but why they divided them and they consider women less you know, the feminine quality is not as important or not as useful. Well, can you bring this? I'll just say, I think that is true. It was, uh, I first started looking at this with through Joseph Campbell, who wrote a long time ago, he wrote brilliant things, but it, he was not willing to say that uh, the Paleolithic era, what the goddess predominated. He said that was a theory. And even in the Neolithic, it's a, it remained a theory, but I think that the goddess predominated. But I think now it's pretty well accepted that uh, there were definitely more images of goddesses than there were gods uh, in the Paleolithic. And or the feminine, Let's, I don't know if they even had the idea of goddess, but feminine. And the feminine was <coughs> at least as important as the masculine in the uh, early Bronze Age. It was really in the iron, by the time you got to the Iron Age, especially after the collapse of the Bronze Age, about 11,000 BC, that uh, the gods started predominating. And one was, and I think iron made a big difference there at the beginning of the Iron Age. And one was weapons, but the second was the plow and, and uh, farm implements. It used to be that uh, when you're using bronze, you or used your hands or bronze instruments in farming, uh, women were, you know, were 
probably led the way in that. And but uh, when you got the plow, then you started introducing draft animals, either mules, I mean donkeys or or, or cows and bulls. That the the men's larger size made them better at dealing with the larger animals, handling this the iron plow, and that also led to I think an increase in the or a change in roles. Let's put it that way: change in roles with the birth of the with the advent of the Iron Age. I just say one thing that they did point out was that um, it seemed like most when the when the goddess was supreme or maybe she wasn't, but that she was very important. And clearly, there are a lot more figurines of the you know the female goddess. I mean, but it was um, mostly the pre-written era. So once they started writing things down they had already started transitioning more to the warrior masculine societies. And so there's not a real, a, a solid written record at all about, you know, the early times when it appears the goddess was predominant. But like they say, I mean, they find all the goddesses, they find the images and there are some um, references and even in the early times when they're transitioning, you know, of women's roles in the society. Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, um, it was so funny when you when you look at like the, for instance, when you know like Isis and Osiris, when they found those figures, they found them on the tombs of, you know, of the people who have passed on because part of that story is about life after death. So it was kind of one of those things where they had to, if you if you think about it, if they had to put it on the tombs for people to pass on to, from one world to the other, that's one of the ways that it was drilled in. And I think, you know, the written, it, I agree with what you said, Penny, about the written, but, it, you know, I think what made the goddess religion stand, uh, still stand or still be told even today it's because of those pictures and the visual aspect of them. So, so just another thing just to add to that. Uh, up next, I have Laura followed by Katie. Well, when I put my name out there um, originally, it had to do with a silly little thing when you were talking about women empowerment. Um, when I took my daughter college shopping years ago, we went to many colleges and Wellesley was one of them. And I have to tell you, every school had an aura around it so that when you got there, you felt its aura. And I will say that Wellesley had an aura of empowerment so powerful. I mean, it was incredible. It just, it, it came out of the pores of the school. So I think there was something to be said about going to female school and empowerment. And I can understand that. Um, and I mean, I went to Tufts and all kinds of places and the, the, the strength of Wellesley College was profound. My second thought was, and now I have to think a little bit about what, oh, okay. So when men went to war, women stayed home. Women had to take control of every single responsibility associated with keeping the farm alive the children alive, their home together. So they had a, a really huge role that they had to assume. So I, I don't know how in any shape, manner, or form that they could be considered having done lesser, you know, because that was a lot that they did. You know, they took over financial stuff, um, you know. So that was my comment there about that. Yeah, what interesting thing to note is, you know, a lot of about women's liberation came after, uh, I forget which war it was, but I, I think it was, I wanna say World War II, but I could be off on that. Because like you said, Laura, women had to, you know, they, they had to go into the factories and make the bullets. They had to, because men were, huh? 
That's World War II. Yeah, and they had to go and make the bullets and they had to like handle the financials and everything. And then the men came back and, you know, the men just wanted the women to just go back into the, you know, go back into the housework and, you know, and women were like, no, we're definitely capable of more than this. And where yeah, they, they also made went to work, you know, they went, they got jobs and went to work and earned money, which they, and they didn't want to stop working. Yeah. Because, you know, they realized their worth and they realized who they were. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a very good point. Um, Brian, do you want to say anything before I move on to Katie? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, up next, I have Katie. Yeah, I think that's where I'd want to take it to. Oh, Katie, did you go on mute? I'm sorry. Is, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I think that's where, because... Because the idea of women in politics, I'm kind of in line with what you were saying, like is something pretty new in the US. So these are strong. I'm kind of curious how the, how motherhood and their leadership, how they kind of, uh, how those two things fit together for these rulers. Because in the, in the society, it seems like they would have been very traditional societies at that time but the then the goddesses are, are very are more powerful so i'm curious how that all plays together yeah now, i think that, go ahead sorry brian i think that's a great topic plus the topic that's been touched on with uh really i guess why men became more important in the wake of war because as laura said women played also very important roles and that goes way it's not just world war ii that goes way back <laughs> i probably to the advent of war i think that's a very good point and i think uh to your question about motherhood katie um i think you'll see that motherhood especially for the goddesses that has children it empowers them. It, it, it makes them stronger. It, um, you know, it, it gives them the will to do almost anything for their children or, you know, anything for their children. So you see that strength in them and you'll see that throughout these series and, and studying it. Uh, I would say on that point, uh, Katie, I think that's a great point. And that's something that struck me in reading all these myths is that there's it's funny how there's very little focus on the act or the role of giving birth. There's very little about that. There's passing references to, you know, the cycles uh, on a daily basis or a yearly basis or a monthly basis. <laughs> but the life giving role of just giving birth and motherhood and raising children my God, that's so important. And I just, uh, when you get beyond the Neolithic, I don't see it uh, valued appropriately. Yeah. That's just me. Thank you. I'll just say, just uh, on another point, the um, this role of motherhood and women, the... Uh, there's another uh, factor worth considering, and that's the commercialization uh, that occurred, uh, commercialization of life, really, of economics, where more and more goods were traded, less and less was manufactured in the home. When things were made in the home, the woman, the woman's role was more dominant. As th things were made outside of the home and were traded, the woman's role became less dominant. The, um, and this is exemplified by what happened in the, uh, I don't know about the late Roman era, but in the, in the Renaissance area in Italy and France, there were these large estates, landed estates, which really continued from the Roman time. And as uh, commerce increased, um, There had been commerce in the dark ages, but as it increased with the Renaissance, people have documented the fact 
that more and more men were pulled out of the home, pulled out of the estate to be integrated into the commercial world, just like people are being integrated into the globalized world today, that men were pulled out of the home, integrated into the commercial world, and importantly, received money for what they were doing. And the at the end of the day, <clears throat> this is a, my theory, it's somebody else's, at the end of the day, uh, the only people left at home were women and mothers, and they're the only ones who didn't get money for their work. <clears throat> it used to be that nobody got money for their work. They were all living off the estate. And when you have the commercialization and the way I outlined, the ones who are left behind were the women just because just they didn't get money. And there's no reason that motherhood should not be monetized. It's a very valuable thing. Good idea. Thank you, Brian. Those are some really good points. I think that's, I didn't even think of it that way until you just said it, but it, it makes perfect sense. Um, up next, I have Sheree Kant, followed by Laura. Well, um, I just want to follow up on what Katie said. Motherhood is crucial. Sons are raised by mothers, <laughs> you know, and that relationship. So it's like when women are put down, you are putting down the next generation of men as well as women. So there is no, no way around that. Uh, so that's it. Wow, that is really profound. That, and it's true. Um, it, it, I know this is going to sound weird, but it made me think of a Tupac song where he talks about motherhood, where, you know, when you raise children, when you raise boys in particular, he was talking about boys and he was talking about boys in the lower income uh, African American neighborhood. I can't sing the lyrics on here, but. Basically, what he said was that when you raise sons to hate women and devalue women, this is the point, that you raise a race of babies that hate the ladies. That's what he said. And he said, you know, but it's the mothers that give birth to them. So you're, you're raising men to hate women that are going to give birth to their sons and daughters. So it, that's a very good point. It just made me think of that. Uh, up next, I have Laura, Joe, and Allison. Um, this goes back to women in war. I also believe that some women tried to sign up to fight in the war. And so they did make an effort as they were not accepted at that time, but they did try. And I think even during the Revolutionary War, there were women fighting. That's it. Just a comment. Mm. That's a very good point. And yeah, it's true that some, I think some men, some women even disguise themselves as men so yeah. that they could fight. Yeah. yeah, they make themselves look like men. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they, they did exist and they did fight. So, so much for. Yeah. yeah. Um, up next, I have Joe. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, as far as giving birth, it's it's interesting because you know one of the things that you think about the feminine and that we talked about during MAPS meeting is this idea of creation uh, and the critical importance of that uh, and how that relates to uh, hierarchies in general. Uh, but yeah, so I just wanted to, to bring that aspect is that the creative aspect of bringing something new into the world um, and the importance of that and in, uh, in, in in uh, in both myth and, and, and divine feminine, so. Yeah, I think we talked about that in the Jordan Peterson Bible series too, about um, the feminine being the creative force and being the creation and the darkness being, uh, the darkness being the feminine because out of it comes everything. So, you know, through the darkness, even in the Christian Bible story, uh, through the dark, through the darkness, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's a very good point. 
Um, so thank you. Uh, Brian, do you want to say anything before I move on to Allison or? No. Okay, just wanted to check. Up next, Allison. Um, what Shrikan said reminded me of like when you're on an airplane and that um, if you the oxygen tanks come down, you have to put it on yourself before you put it on your child. So if we don't protect women, we're not protecting sons. Um, and, and also every childbirth, I mean, anytime a woman is pregnant, it's a potential risk to her life. And, um, you know, there's been a big rise in C-sections and some people like, oh, well, why are they doing that? Well, when a C-section is done, it's because there is a risk that if the woman goes through labor, she might not survive labor. And we kind of, you know, in our modern day times, we act like, oh, women never die in childbirth, but um, partly they're not dying because they're having C-sections. You know, there are many, many reasons why, you know, and, um, but, you know, even in our modern times, every time a woman is pregnant, she is taking on, you know, she's literally risking her life to bring the child into the world. So it's important to respect that, I think. And, you know. I 100% agree with that. Yeah, so true. And one thing about C-section, what people really don't realize, and um, is that a C-section is a surgery, right? Like, you know, OBGYNs will tell you all the time, like, you know, people don't think of them as surgeons and they're like, they're absolutely surgeons. They have to be, because if something goes wrong, they need to go in and get that baby out. So they are, they have to study surgery and they have to know how to do that. So yeah, literally, you know, appreciating women for bringing life into this world is key. And, and when you have a C-section, you, you know, you, it's not like a regular surgery where you can just recover. You have an eight week recovery period, but you're taking care of an infant <laughs> while recovering from being cut, you know, from one end to the next. Yeah. Yeah. On, the, on the cynical side, are they doing more C-sections because they are surgeries and they can make more money? I can answer that question from knowing that OBJYN and the answer is no. No. It would be a big risk if something went wrong in surgery and it wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be worth the cost to the hospital or to, to the doctor because they could oh. be sued for malpractice. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So no. I said it was a cynical side. I yeah. Wish, I don't really believe those things, but I thought I had to throw it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so up next, I have Penny followed by Connie. I just what we were saying just reminded me and, and from the, the goddess book saying one of the reasons that the goddess was the initial great you know the highest deity was because the woman is the one who gave birth and it was clear to everybody that that was where life came from was from the woman and so she she was the creative force she was the you know created the whole cycle of life and they associated of course her with the earth too and the earth bringing life the same way that women gave life and so I think that was um, a recognition early of the you know the very importance and the role of of the women and uh, motherhood thank you uh, thank you Peggy. I was thinking of that and I was remember reading in the book um, that the early temples, weren't they, you know, uh, pictures of the women's womb and, you know, vagina because it did bring life and that's why they mimicked the women's anatomy in that sense? I did get that right, right? There are some temples that are, yes, constructed like that, not all of them. That's absolutely true. Thank you. Uh, up next, I have Connie. I, know, I mean, yeah, not just um, incidentally, intentionally, they were intentionally built that way. <laughs> yes, I'm listening to this and um, I keep, when I think of feminism, feminism and masculine, you know, the traits, I, I don't think of sex uh, of male and female. So I'm kind of not, um, I'm going to have to learn a lot during this session because to me, there are 
as you said in the very beginning, that each we we should have all the traits, you know, it should be balanced. So we seem to be talking about women, maybe because that's a topic of the class. Um, I, I don't, um, I'm, I don't know how to say this. I don't, uh, I have a diff very difficult time when I start trying to talk, as you've noted before, um, my mind jumbles. But I, I think I'm more interested, maybe I'll just say it that way, in the feminine aspects and the masculine aspects in both male and female, and not necessarily um, the, the woman versus a man. Like, so I, I'll, I'll just listen and learn, I'm sure, through this session. I, I hope that made some sense to someone, but thank you. No, it absolutely makes perfect sense. And I think when you, so, when you are talking about these stories uh, and when we're gonna be going over these stories, yes, we're gonna focus on the feminine, uh, the goddesses because they haven't really been focused on in modern culture. But in telling the stories, the masculine figures will come through as well. And yeah, I agree. I don't want this to be a, a male versus female or masculine versus feminine. I just wanted it to be balanced. And I think, like I said before, we're. I guess the focus is going to be more on the feminine aspect because it just hasn't been focused on. Like even when we studied, uh, uh, you know, the Gita or, you know, or uh, the Bible, it it was male dominated. Just it's just just because that's the way it was, right? Um, so we just want to like swing the pendulum a little bit. So that's why it may seem like it's leaning more towards the feminine right now. But we are going to have that balance, I think, and you're going to see that throughout the stories. I'd like to oh, comment okay. on what okay. Connie that, said. That Thank you, that helped. Go, okay. go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I'd also like to comment. The um, Number one, Katie put in the uh, comments archetypes, which yes, I think that's true. I think probably uh, archetypes is another way to look at what, as a framework for looking at what we're doing um, in addition to the integration theory. And in my opinion, the book, uh, she, uh, Isabella Price flags integration theory, but I think her book breaks out more in, in the, when she tells the stories more in terms of archetypes and can be understood that way as as exemplars of certain traits. But um, the other, so yeah, I think everything is headed the way your point and my understanding is very much in line with yours. The, uh, but I don't think it'll come out in just one meeting. I think over a series of meetings, when we look at a lot of different goddesses in a lot of different contexts, uh, you'll see that these qualities are not are in no way set in stone. There are a lot of different qualities. And then the last, uh, or, or mix and match of qualities. And the last thing I'd say is, uh, uh, for whatever reason in the West, uh, we've had a tendency to anthropomorphize spirits. <clears throat> and the, um, so, you know, just feeling are anthropomorphized, human qualities are anthropomorphized. So we did tend to think of these uh, of qualities in terms of people, uh, personal qualities. And that's, uh, that's just the part of the tradition that we've inherited. And I think it's a, I don't know quite how it is in the East, but yin and yang, I think is a less, a less anthropomorphized symbol. And so probably less the feminine and uh, let's say the complementary powers are not viewed so much as uh, embodied in any particular gender. And I think right, that's because, probably... Yeah, because like uh, you think of any men poets, uh, they would have a lot more feminine, I would think, characteristics versus um, that, you know, the warriors uh, would be the more, would have... Uh, more masculine. But thank you so much. I'm looking forward to really listening through all these wonderful sessions. Thank you.
Shall Thank we get you, started Tom. with the? Uh, oh, sorry. Shall what? We, shall we get started with ISIS? Yeah, whenever, whenever you're ready. For me, that's been this has been great. The uh, I think the for me the biggest takeaway was the first one between Dave and Nevenique, and just talking about this it validates the feminine. And so the people are coming from the feminine are more emboldened. I think someone used that word, more emboldened to express themselves, which I think is a, already a great thing. The, um, so let me just talk here briefly about the ISIS. The, uh, I am gonna rely on what's in this book because again, there's so many different versions. If you have some additional facts you want to bring to the table, uh, you're welcome to do that. I've also left out some things because this is a web of gods and goddesses and stories and relationships and events. At some point you just, and Isis was involved with a lot of other events and goddesses and relationships. At some point you had to just draw the line and say, you know, for the purpose of discussion today, uh, I'm going to focus on certain things. So some things have been left out. If you want to bring them back in, you're welcome to do that. The um, I have broken out uh, Isis. Oh, Isis, first of all, is a uh, an ancient Egyptian goddess, ancient Egyptian goddess. But she was um, a very popular goddess, first of all, in Egyptian times. But after that was uh, also very popular in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. So that, uh, let's see if I can find this here. Uh, her cults, her temples, um, her stories, her persona uh, was spread throughout the Middle East, uh, throughout the Mediterranean and the Middle East from Persia to as far as as Rome and Spain. So a very popular figure that outlived uh, many different cultures. Also, I would say this isn't, um, comes out somewhat in the book, but not completely. Um, yes, it is a figure that evolved over thousands of years. So even before we had the early dynastic period in Egypt, uh, there were hints of goddesses like Isis. And that understanding of the goddess like her uh, changed over the centuries. So, you know, again, we're not dealing with uh, uh, just a snapshot, uh, a figure that was that came and went like a celebrity. This was a, a very important figure that had important influence uh, throughout the world uh, in many different ways for a long period of time. Uh, I want to start out with a preliminary about the, um, her family background, so it gets a little bit confusing, so I'm not going to overdo that, but she was uh, born into a family of gods and goddesses, and these are the, I've taken her characteristics and broken them out into certain spheres of influence, the, uh, all based on this book. And the spheres of influence are nature, uh, medicine and healing, culture, and politics. The, uh, you know, you could add more to that list, but that's, I think, a good start. The, um, so I want to give the family background a little bit first because that ties into nature. The nature, uh, her role in nature is well understood or can be well understood by understanding her role, where she fits in with her family. Now, uh, she's in the, uh, the third generation of gods, third generation, which already is, makes your head spin. Um, but I'm not counting as the first generation, the first God, which was Atum. And I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it. Atum was a one, was one person, one entity or non-entity. You can, you can discuss what, 
I'm not going to spend time on the nature of autumn. Uh, autumn gave birth to uh, two children, uh, a male and a female. The male was Shu, and the female was Tefnut. And Shu was the uh, the male was the god of air, space, and light. So basically, things above the water and the earth. And Tefnut was moisture and water. Then uh, they gave Tefnut and Shu. So, if you will, this is just a very, let's just say, it's a very basic breakdown of the cosmology. It's tied into a cosmogony of a family of gods. So, out of the void, out of Atman, came air, space, and light on the one hand, basically everything above the ground and water, and then Tefnut, everything below. And they're given, these are obviously physical phenomenon. They're given, they're considered to have a spiritual quality and that spiritual quality is anthropomorphized as male and female. The, um, then each of them gave birth to a boy and a girl. So male and female, the uh, boy, so this would be the basically the grandson of Atum, the son of Shu and Tefnut. He is Geb, G-E-B. He's the god of the earth. And then the, uh, the granddaughter, so the sister of Geb is Nut, N-U-T. And she's the goddess of the sky. So right away, I just want to flag, this is so confusing. And the only way to keep it straight is that uh, this happened, this cosmogony, this understanding of these gods have evolved over centuries, centuries. And the... Uh, because I'll just point out here, we have Shu, who's air, space, and light. He's the son of Atum. And then we have the granddaughter of Atum, who's the sky. Now, there is some you know, reason for that. And that's the, uh, the sky was considered to separate out <clears throat> uh, uh, the waters from the earth. We'll get to that in a minute, but the um, it does get to be very confusing, and to kind of add to the confusion, and I'll just flag this here because it doesn't fit at least on Isabella Price's presentation doesn't really fit well into the family tree. There is another goddess out there, which plays an important role, and that is Hathor. H a t h o r. Hathor is the god, the cow goddess. Cows and bulls were very important in Egypt, even in a very early day. And uh, the cow especially was associated with abundance and prosperity. But there was a, the female cattle were, uh, was Hathor uh, embodied or epitomized by Hathor. The god was, uh, the bull was Apis, A-P-I-S. And they do, I'll just say, because I've read about this recently, uh, a lot of these things are still being discovered. And the most, the earliest discovered, this is very recent, the earliest discovered excavations of uh, temples to Hathor are uh, in the, the lower Egypt. And so down the, up, away from the Delta, up the river. And there were discoveries of Hathor evolving as, and Apis, I suppose, but Hathor was the one discovered, evolving as her own goddess, quite apart from this family tree I'm giving you. So it's like a separate 
God or a separate God and goddess that's just part, separate and apart from this family tree. And you, it, you can kind of see that because one is based on a cosmology and the other one is based on animals. <coughs> All right. The, uh, but I mentioned it because they both play a role in ISIS, for ISIS. Now, uh, Geb and Newt, uh, the grandson and granddaughter of Atum, they gave birth to four children. The, uh, let's just say the, it's not fair, but let's just say the good ones and the bad ones. There was a good uh, son and daughter and a bad son and daughter. The good son and daughter, Osiris was the son, Isis was the daughter. The bad one was Seth and Nephthys. Seth was the son, Nephthys was the daughter. It's not really fair for Nephthys because I think that's the least fair for her because she's uh, the goddess of the underworld. She takes care of souls. She's a goddess of darkness. And we've talked about, you know, the goddess, the darkness can be a source of nurturing and creation. Um, so she, and she, and she was also a goddess of households. So she had a, she is not viewed as negatively as Seth is in the stories. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, Osiris um, was the king god. So already, I think now at this point, we're, we're in a period uh, where we don't have, we just don't, we don't have just natural phenomena like the sky, the earth, water, moisture, darkness, light. These suggest a, a very earlier genesis for these uh, gods and goddesses. Even the cow and the bull, an earlier genesis, probably a, Neolith, early Neolithic. But, but the uh, now, when we get into this next generation, and you kind of, at least for me, I get a hint for how this is evolving, we're starting to get goddesses that capture the spirit of kings and queens. So we're moving beyond, uh, you know, simple, a simple society to a rather organized civilization. And at that point, we get another generation of gods and goddesses to capture the spirit of that. And uh, Isis is the queen and Os Osiris is the god. And then the kind of they have their counterparts, the dark side, Seth and Nephthys. All right. The, um, so that's the breakdowns of the gods and goddesses. The, as I said, the, uh, I think that the, when you get the god, the great, the granddaughters, Osiris and, I, uh, uh, and Isis, yeah, you're, this, this is uh, reflecting developments in the Egyptian civilization. This, these occurred at a later date. And that's, I think that's probably generally agreed. The other thing is that's kind of interesting is that the um, Isis sometimes would take over the roles and functions of her mother and grandmother. So it was just another, it's another iteration of these uh, qualities that are embodied with her and the qualities that, uh, that had been with uh, Nefut to some extent and with Newt, so the grandmother and the, and the mother are now also captured by Isis and those are tend to be nature oriented. <laughs> And what are they? It's the cycles of the day and cycles of the year. And I'd probably add to that the, um, uh, you know, cycles of the month, although Isabella doesn't talk about that in her book. The, um, the cycle of the day is as follows, that uh, Isis is goddess of the horizon. Who get, and the horizon gives birth to the sun every day. Horizon gives birth to the sun every day. And so she, Isis, gives birth to the sun god, Ray, every day. 
And she, uh, as Hathor, that's now the other goddess, as Hathor, she sustains the sun god throughout the day. And then when the sun sets, the sun, Ray, the Ray God goes over into the underworld of darkness and he's say sustained by uh, Isis's sister during the night. He goes down under the earth and uh, is sustained in the darkness by Nephthys. Okay. The, um, To complete the picture on Hathor, the, uh, the Egyptian uh, cosmology had Geb, who's the earth. He's basically, uh, let's just say he's a, a cattle or a bull and he's lying on his back with his legs up in the air. And Hathor is up in the sky. She's standing on his feet like they're acrobats doing a stunt or something. But they're the ones, this, it's this, uh, this maneuver that creates the space between the earth and the sky. And then uh, the waters uh, that are separated in this phenomenon uh, are come through Hathor as milk from her utter. And so she sustains the sun on the ray on his path uh, each day. He suckers on the utter of Hathor. So that's a little bit uh, completing that picture. She's also obviously a female goddess. The, um, all right. Isis is also called creator of the Nile flood, creator of the Nile flood every year, obviously very important, probably relates back even to Atum, the very first god who was neither male nor female, because uh, he brought out the first, he brought the first uh, things, the first creation out of the water as a muddy hill. It sounds just like what would happen when the floods of the Nile are receding. And now that quality that Atman had has passed on to Isis on an annual basis. She's the one who creates the flood. The, um, and then of course, for that, she's, uh, oh, She's associated with the star Sirius because Sirius was uh, the, the star that appeared whenever the flood started. Uh, the appearance of the star Sirius was the advent for the Egyptians was the advent of the flooding season. And so she was associated with that, uh, with that star. All right, the next thing is that, that she's associated with is medicine and healing. That's because she had uh, important role to, to play as the mother in the family, was very healing towards, mothers are healing towards their children. She's healing towards all of mankind. Plus uh, she managed to acquire some esoteric wisdom and magic power from uh, Atum. In the... Uh, In the Egyptian mythology, words had power. Autumn create things, created things by simply calling them into being. He spoke the words and they came into being. So words were considered to be very powerful. Uh, Isis wanted to obtain his powers. So she tricked him into telling him his name, the basis of his name. <laughs> And when he acquired that, she acquired that knowledge, she was able to access the magical and healing powers that he alone had. So the, uh, that's how, that's the basis of her healing powers, which were brought to humanity in her role as uh, a mother figure. 
The next one I think is really important, the culture. Um, this ties in so well with what I think is the Neolithic, the, the, the advent of agriculture. She is the goddess of crossbreeding and domestication of plants and animals. So already they knew about obviously domestication of animals, herding, but crossbreeding of plants, I had never heard that until I read this. Uh, obviously childbirth, which we've touched on uh, before, weaving, pottery, corn grinding, and bread making, and also the institution of the marriage. Now, I think these are interesting because, uh, first of all, I, they show the central role of the, of the divine feminine in early culture, but also the very interesting thing to me is that Osiris had all the same qualities. And they, they operated, at, that's a simplification, but they operated as king and queen as partners and were in some extent interchangeable. So they, the difference between them is not, uh, is not well defined. And then finally now in politics, I wanna be brief on it because I've already spent more time than I thought, but the, um, there's a whole story and I was gonna to try to read episodes of it because it's quite a story, but she, um, she is integral in politics, not just because she's an equal with Osiris and rules with him. And when he's gone, she rules in her own name, but she's also very much involved in the succession and transition uh, of power. Osiris uh, uh, had a brother, Seth. Seth, he's obviously a god. He's a god too. Uh, Seth is very jealous of Osiris being a god and being married to Osiris, uh, Isis. <clears throat> so he says he wants to kill. He decides he wants to kill Osiris. And so it gives a party. And for this party, he has a casket built. And he says, who, Seth says, whoever fits perfectly into this casket, I will give it to him or her as a gift. And so silly Osiris gets into the casket and of course it fits perfectly. Seth and his buddies close down the lid and they cast the casket into the Nile where it floats all the way up to Byblos in uh, Phoenicia and Canaan. And there's a king and queen up there that uh, are, first of all, the casket grows into a tree. The tree then gets cut down by the king and queen of Phoenicia because it's such a great tree. And they use it as a column in their palace. Uh, Isis then comes into the story in that uh, she laments terribly the, <clears throat> the death of Osiris, but doesn't leave it at that. It's find him and she does turn the casket and the tree all the way to the palace of the Phoenician king and queen and she's able to recover it and bring him home and uh, although he's dead uh, she's able to revive him sufficient that uh, that she can procreate with him and gives birth to Horus uh, that's the son who becomes the king the uh, Seth is uh, upset with his, with the return of Osiris, and so has him chopped into pieces. Uh, we're not sure how many, but the, uh, and has those pieces spread all over Egypt. Osiris again uh, laments the death, but then goes and finds all those pieces, has presumably has them embalmed and then uh, buried in a, each in its own temple. So there are temples to Osiris all over Egypt. That's Isis doing. And the uh, after he's chopped up, uh, Osiris then, uh, he doesn't die. He go well, he dies, but he goes to the underworld and becomes the king of the underworld, presumably with uh, Nephthys, the daughter, excuse me, the sister who is uh, in the underworld. 
And I, I'll just flag for you, that is almost identical to the Sumerian story, the very ancient Sumerian story for the creation of the god and goddess of the underworld. But um, I'll leave it at that. That's, so those are politics, uh, culture, healing, and medicine, and nature, all attributed to Osiris, who is a very important figure throughout Egyptian history, including the Hellenistic and the Roman periods where Egyptian influence was quite significant. So I apologize, I went on, this is just my first time through this. I went on a little bit too long. I'll turn it back to Ebony. Thank you, Brian. Um, uh, there is some, you know, that was a really good telling of, you know, the story of Isis and Osiris and also the history in the background, which I just think is really important. So now, um, before we move on, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, I see David has his hand raised. So if anybody else has questions and or comments, you can either type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. So up first is David. Thanks, uh, Brian. Uh, perhaps you can help me with a uh, historical question. After Alexander the Great, uh, his general Ptolemy uh, took over Egypt and successfully enhanced the Isis religion uh, by combining it with the Greek uh, Eleusian mysteries. Uh, now, what's still puzzling me is why did Ptolemy change the name of Osiris to Serapis? I haven't been able to find uh, out. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that that name had been changed, although I'm familiar with Serapis. So that is really interesting to me. Uh, I do. I did not know that, that was a name change. That's that's a wow factor for me. Yes. Yeah, so when the Christians uh, uh, crushed the ISIS religion, they were destroying the temples, and the temples were known as Serapians after Osiris, who was had, who Ptolemy had renamed um, Serapis for whatever reason. Uh, th that I don't know, but of course that religion oh, well, lasted. Here several centuries it, it was quite successful that combination of the two because Ptolemy wanted to combine the Egyptian and the Greek right okay I think I might be wrong about this I, this is just a guess the, I think Serapis was actually the name of one of the the Ptolemies and he uh he was the one who created the sect he or let's put it differently he changed the name uh I'm guessing that he changed the name and yes, he also yes, added another yes. name. He also added another name. Serapis Christus was his, he called himself. And his followers were the Therapoids. And some of the early Christian writers say that the first Christians were actually the Therapoids. So that's quite a tie in. Um, I don't know whether any of that is true, but. Uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Thank you. For yeah, that. thank you. Thank you. Mm. Uh, if anybody else has any questions or comments, uh, you can either type exclamation point in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, if not, uh, I'll give it 30 seconds, and then if not, I will um, just add a few things uh, to what Brian said. Okay, if we don't have anybody, I'm going to go back actually to the presentation. So oh, I'm going. Oh, wait. Sorry, guys, I meant to share my screen first. Um, so let me do that. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, I can see it. 
Great. So now I'm just going to go in. I think this should work. Of course not. Um, so uh, going back to uh, Isis and Osiris, I just wanted to bring together some of the things um, and some of the themes throughout that Brian had already mentioned, but I just want to talk just a, for a few minutes about. And so um, Isis and Osiris is the story of family uh, life after death and popularity. One of the things, like I said before, um, these stories were written on the tombs of Egyptians that were going into the underworld. And that's because of the story of Osiris, um, you know, after Isis put him back together and mended him back together, you know, she sent him into the underworld to rule, um, you know, after she conceived a child with him. Um, and this is one of the mo more popular stories. And it, I think it's the, one of the more popular stories because it just has all of the elements, right? It has life, death, uh, jealousy, uh, betrayal, all of those things, right? So I, I think this is one of those stories that I think everybody can see themselves in at some point, obviously to not the degree that you would cut up your brother or sister, uh, obviously, but you know, you could just understand some of the emotions of it. Um, so another thing, like we said, it's set in Osiris. Um, that is similar to Cain and Abel and the jealousy and the one brother uh, killing the other, you know, um, Cain was jealous of Abel because he received God's favor and Seth was jealous of Osiris because Osiris was ruling the kingdom and Seth uh, also you know wanted to be with Isis so there's that theme of jealousy and betrayal and also wanting the brother's kingdom now of point um, and I don't know if we're going to walk through this but I just thought this was so interesting is that when we talked about um, the shadow and Jordan Peterson actually talks about the shadow in one of his lectures and he mentions Osiris because he says Osiris and said is, you know, the story kind of can be similar to Osiris not looking at his dark side, which is the brother set. And when you, do, when you don't pay attention to your shadow, it comes out in ways that you don't want, want it to. And this is one of the ways, obviously, Set tricks Osiris into the coffin and kills him. But that was because, it could be because he wasn't paying attention to that. So that's one thing. And so one of the things uh, about stories is that they do travel. And Brian did mention this. So again, I'm not going to go too much in the weeds with this, but um you know, the Isis story in Greece starts off with, you know, Osiris being tricked into the coffin and moving on. Um, you know, Brian already talks about a lot of this being in the trees, but I, the point is that a good story travels, right? And so, um, and I have this out of order, so sorry, Brian, but, um, but it actually, I'm sorry, I there are different stories of Isis and Osiris, and this is not the one telling in Isabella Price's book, but in other myths, and this is the thing with myths, they do differ. Uh, they say that, you know, that si Isis first put together Osiris and then conceives a child with him. So there's there's just different variations to it. I, I'm not really wanting to get into the point which one is true, but... Um, I wanted to emphasize this because the story travels and that's how stories get into different cultures. And so you can see that the Isis story starts off in Egypt, but you can see it travels to other lands. And even with the conversation between David and Brian, you can see it leaks into other cultures, right? So, I mean, and that's the mark of a good story is that it's telling um, the story of human beings and that it travels and people adopt it. Uh, so the Isis story in Rome, just some, a couple of things I wanted to add to that. Um, you know, they adopt the story of Isis. And so it was thought, and I don't know how true this is, but uh, when I was looking at the philosophical, um, I think it's called the Philosophical Society, they did a lecture on this. And they were saying Cleopatra thought of herself as Isis. 
uh, which I just thought was very interesting. Um, but the way it took place in Rome is that it was one of the mystery religions because of the magical, magical and rituals built around Isis because of like what Brian said earlier about, you know, uh, her, you know, being the, you know, being able to produce crops and fertility and things of that nature. And uh, in this mystery religious, only select people can be followers of ISIS. And why did this come up? And which is why I think this part of the story is really important. Um, it grew in part because women wanted an active role in religious practice. And if you think about it, you know, women didn't have, especially in patriarchal societies, they didn't have a leadership role. And as a matter of fact, it was discouraged. So, you know, ISIS was a story to women of an example of empowerment. So, you know, women felt like, you know, they could join this ISIS cult and, you know, as ISIS being the leader because she was the one that put um, Osiris back together and she's the one that mends things together and women could relate to that. And so I, I just wanted to bring up those things, but the final thing I wanted to bring up and I wanna ask the question again is, where do you see yourselves in this story of Isis and Osiris? And of course you can comment on anything or you know talk about anything you want, but that's just a question I wanna put out there and you don't necessarily have to answer it tonight. It's just something that you can walk away from. Just wanted to give people something to walk away from and think about because the stories, these stories are meant to you know have you look at yourself right and you know and see what like see the qualities you see in yourself and these uh and these goddesses and gods so uh that's it so let me stop sharing so if you have let me just check the chat so Sheree Khan, i see you have a question or comment and yeah yes uh so i want to give one more version of the story of ISIS, this is from Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. It's focused on just one aspect of, of ISIS. The way he presents it, Osiris was a king who built Egypt with his consort, ISIS. Osiris represented culture. Isis nature. Osiris represented structure. Isis, the openness to modifying that structure. But then Osiris was getting old and set in his ways. So then what was happening was that he became just attached to the structure and was not able to see anything new. So he did not notice what was happening with his brother Set, which allowed Set to kill him. Now, of course, Isis was mad when, uh, when Set killed Osiris. He, she brought back the body of uh, Osiris and had a son, Horus. Now, Horus is the son of both Osiris and Isis. He has both the elements of structure and elements of openness. He has both ability to order and openness to chaos. So he's able to do new things and he uses that in order to defeat Seth. So the thing I like about this story is that it captures the role of Isis here. It's when Osiris becomes old and gets away from the creative faculty, openness faculty of being able to deal with changes that results in his death. And then it is Isis's life. She's the one who brings back new life by getting Osiris and creating Horus. And Horus, because he has both those elements from Osiris and Isis, is able to do something 
that Osiris could not do. So I, I love this, you know, the, the role of ISIS as presented by Jordan Peterson in Maps of Meaning. So just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, that was great because uh, you expressed that way better than I ever could have. So thank you. Um, that is, uh, let me just say a couple of things about that. That is a, a great story. Um, just to flag a couple of things. It's, it, it, I think it highlights the transgenerational role of women. Another, another uh, I think topic that, that isn't discussed enough and isn't valued enough. <coughs> She was, a, she was a pivotal figure in moving from Osiris to Horus. And obviously it's a cycle, it's, you know, it's an archetype, it's a cycle, it's something that happens over and over again. And the fact that it happens over and over again is, uh, is captured in the symbol in Egypt that um, the throne that Osiris that the king sat on was called the Isis throne, the Isis throne. And because she is the one who raises up and nurtures and brings this young man to the point where he, he can be king and then sustains him. Shit, that is the Isis throne. And I'll, that's uh, actually, that's an evolution of the image because the image is uh, one of the uh, originally the image was one of Horus, the child sitting in the lap of Isis in a chair. She's sitting upright and he is uh, she is suckling him at the breast. And that the iconography of that many, many people say is the basis for the iconography of Mary and Jesus. <laughs> I don't know about that, but that's the kind of uh, the force of that image. It's a very powerful, um, very powerful archetype. Yeah, just one thing uh, about that. Uh, I think like from what I understand that, yeah, I, that they uh, compare that image to the image of Mary and Jesus, but it's also very controversial because um, unlike, you know, Isis, unlike uh, Jesus, Horus, uh, who is Isis's son, uh, eventually gets mad about, uh, so just really quick, um, and I want to be quick because I know we're running out over time a little bit. So basically, you know, when Horus gets older, you know, uh, Horus and Set have this uh, dispute or argument, like Horus wants to rule and he basically, so they have this, uh, it's a battle, right? And um, basically, Isis shows mercy to Set. And Osiris, I mean, not Osiris, Horus gets mad and cuts off Isis's head. And that's another image of the cow head that gets put on her and why she gets the cow head because there's that. So I think there's a, a little bit of controversy with that. Um, so that is a part of the story and that has been compared, but some Christians don't like being, that being compared to just because of what Horace did to Isis. So um, just a little, just to add to what Brian said. So uh, so thank you, Brian, for at, bringing that up. Uh, up next, I have Joe followed by Penny. And if anyone else wants to uh, comment or has questions, you can either type exclamation point in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Avanik, and thank you, Srikant, uh, for you know the, those explanations. That was an extremely complex story, uh, and so. But I do think it kind of highlighted a couple of things. It's this uh, the idea of knowledge and wisdom uh, that ISIS actually provides. Horus and Osiris with in order to allow them to, to govern. Uh, so I think that this is, this is, um, it's important because then, uh, you know, once being set in your ways and not being able to change it, you know, and being going down to the underworld, 
that there was that was a process of being reborn and created recreated uh and um we kind of saw some similar things during our bible series as well uh now i know this is more about the feminine aspect of things but uh when when uh you know jesus was you know criticizing the political institutions of the time uh, for not being open as opposed to looking at the the function the the reasons as to why uh you know some of the miracles that he was creating or, or um uh, not creating actually uh performing that uh that people were not focused on the the miracle or it was they were worried about whether it was performed on the sabbath or things on that along those lines uh but they and they weren't open to essentially uh any kind of change or any kind of uh, understanding of, of of you know that this was essentially god's son uh as the story goes um but i think that you know the interesting thing here is how isis provides knowledge wisdom and create in the creative function uh in the story overall uh i i think that that's a it's a it's an important it, it shows you the value of the feminine that she brought she helped bring order to the chaos uh that that um that, that existed so anyway those are just some really quick thoughts but i, I want to thank you both again for for um for telling that story that was really difficult to do so thank you yeah, thank just to Jim. follow up on just to follow up on Isis' role and what Joe said, the uh, just look at what she did with uh, when Isis was uh, entombed in this casket and drifted off to Byblos. She was fully engaged emotionally. She was devoted to him. Uh, she persevered and was patient in finding him. She went, brought him back, and had a purpose in mind that was really, uh, it was, it was uh, political in scope. So it just, uh, it shows how many, the, the depth and breadth of that, of that goddess. It's uh, amazing what she did and how pivotal that role was. That's that's already a heroin story right there. It it absolutely is, um, and you know the interesting thing is how does that you know I'm listening to this story. If you're kind of governing Egypt at the time too, the importance that you're learning from this actual story itself. Uh, so I was just thinking about how the political structures themselves may have been informed actually by this story. Uh, anyway, that's just another thought that I had as well, that, that the, the power of myth um, in this particular instance, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, kind of, it's kind of important for anybody that was governing at that particular moment in time. But thank you. Thank you, well, Joe. It may, have varied. it may have varied from time to time, but during uh, Egyptian history, women were able to serve as pharaohs just like men. Thank you guys, thank you both. Um, you guys both brought up some really good and interesting points. And I just wanted to add a quick note is that you can see, you know, the masculine and feminine in Isis. And you can also see the masculine and feminine in Osiris and in Set and, you know, Joe, when Joe brought up the point about order and chaos and that Isis actually in this instance brought the order and set in a sense created chaos and you know Isis had to like put it all back together again she had to bring order back when she had to put Isis, Osiris back together again she had to bring order back so I, I think those were all really great points so thank you both um, up next, I have Penny, Sheree Kant, and Rupali. So, Penny, you're up. Okay, I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about uh, 
the how long you know the ISIS um, was uh, important and you know and and you know I said before an empire and they had set that religion and that they felt like uh, they, they got a spiritual awakening when they reenacted the story of her, um, what she had done with Osiris and going into the underworld and, and you know, putting them together again. And people felt that this was um, valuable to them and um, created- Turn off your video because you're breaking up. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. Right on another. Well, just that they they felt that it was a uh, example of like a, a a spiritual reawakening because of the mystical qualities that she had, the magical qualities in bringing Osiris um, back to life, and you know that the, she was an inspiration for centuries. Thank you, Penny. Um, up next, I have Sheree Kant followed by Rupali. I just wanted to quickly address um, Joe's point about how this applies to the Bible. Um, when I was making a presentation on this, um, you know, Peter Berkman was there. So I was talking about spirit and matter. You know, Jesus is basically a combination of spirit and matter. And matter is the same word as mother. So that it's basically, it's a combination of God and Mary, the mother. So originally the mother, you know, Mary had a very big role in the whole story. And that was reduced dramatically over time. So, uh, just wanted to say that I mean, even the, even the words themselves kind of come from there. Thank you. Well, that's something I didn't know. That's a really interesting point. Um, so you're saying it was mother and matter are the same, were meant the same thing? It's the word, mater is the word for mother in Latin. Uh -huh. And mater is the same. It's the same word. It is the same root in Latin. Ah, so it's a combination of spirit and matter. So human beings are a combination of spirit and matter. So these two elements is what we are composed of. And these are natural parts of us. We have a soul and we have a body and they work together. And you can't have one without the other. It's just one being with both these aspects. So that's, that's, what, that's what it means. Thank you so much. That, that's really interesting. Uh, thanks, yeah. uh, Monique. Up next, I have Rupali. Hi, Evanik and Prime. Thank you, for, and Shrikant. Uh, this is a very nice uh, conversation. I've been looking forward to this meetup for a while. Uh, so now I have just a couple of things to say. Uh, one is that, you know, why? Does Isis not take over the kingdom? Why does she have to bring Osiris back to life? Uh, part of the thought is that, is it the balance between the male and the female? Or was the society so patriarchal that they couldn't have a female ruler? Uh, so that's one question I have about the story itself. And then just an observation about you know, all the qualities that make Isis, the strength that she has, the nurturing element. Um, as Brian said, it goes across generations. And I think that's, um, those are qualities of women around the world throughout generations. So thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Um, as to the question of why she couldn't rule the kingdom, that is a very good question that I don't have an answer offhand. Brian, do you want to add anything to that? 
No, I have no answer, except that, uh, of course, we're talking about a goddess here, so who, someone who's remembered over generations, and I can tell you that certainly during much of Egyptian history, during many of those centuries, uh, a woman was able to be a pharaoh. And there were some prominent women pharaohs. So at, uh, at why, why uh, that was in this story, maybe somebody else has an idea about that. I do not. If anyone wants to comment, they can either type exclamation point in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. So Evanik, I'll just add while Brian was talking, I was thinking that, well, the storyteller had their perspective, right? The, the end that the storyteller wants to um, share. And so if she would rule, then uh, the story would have been very different and we would know it differently. That's just one thought I have. That's a very good thought. Um, when you said that, it just made me think of, you know, I was thinking because, you know, even before all this happened, like Osiris was the ruler and it, I, I don't, I still don't have a good answer, um, but a theory is maybe, it, it, it may have seemed like maybe she didn't want to rule. Like when I studied ISIS, it didn't seem like leadership and and like not even leadership. I think she, she's, she's a great leader, but I think power, like having that power did, didn't matter to her. Like she was powerful in her own right and maybe she didn't want to rule for whatever reason. I think she was happy with what she was doing but but then again it's a very good point because we don't really know that much about what happened like you know like Osiris's rule of the kingdom and I think it would be a very good point to research for yeah, myself I, yeah I like that question a lot I could look closer at that particular episode because I'm not clear that Osiris uh, ruled after Hor after Isis gave birth to Horus. Certainly the more important period was when Horus became the king and the more important dynamic, according to the stories, is uh, the transition from one generation to the next. So one way that she might have played a role or a continuing role as exemplified by, in, by her motherhood, is that she could have been a regent who helped rule when, uh, when Horace was a child. But I, I've never read anything that says that. But that would be possible because Osiris was, uh, he was cut up and went to the underworld to become king of the underworld. He wasn't uh, king of Egypt anymore. And one interesting point is that they did have a, a, I can't pronounce the name offhand, but, uh, you know, I, uh, Isis's sister ruling the underworld. So there were definitely that, that's a sense of a woman can be a ruler. So I don't know if it was ruled out. And I think when we study, um, you know, when we delve deeper into the goddesses, you'll definitely see instances where women are rulers. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question. I I am going to research it because I'm interested. Uh, David, uh, you're up yes. next. Yeah, one possibility is that the the uh, god or the godhead is um, or the ultimate godhead is seen as the holy family. And, which is exemplified, of course, in the in the Trinity, um, you know, the Father, the Mother, and the Son. Of course, one could ask then, well, <laughs> where's the daughter? But, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So you know, God being seen as, as as a family, as the holy family, not just male, not just female, but you know, as a family. It's a possibility. I mean, how yeah. how 
Okay. How much accepted that viewpoint is, I've got no idea, but okay. Mm. Well, I think that's a very good viewpoint. I'll have to look more about, you know, I'll look more into the details of that part of the episode, but that the way you're laying it out is certainly the way it's portrayed and, you know, pictorially and symbolically, uh, even centuries after this episode, Osiris and uh, Isis and Horus all together. Well, all the pagan trinities were the mother, the father, and the son. But as I just said, you know, we could you could ask, well, well, what, where's the daughter? <laughs> I mean, that's one criticism of that concept of uh, of holy family. It does, you know, it's the mother, father, and the son. Hmm. Right. Well, I guess that I mean, two answers. Number one, the the son is going to marry a daughter, somebody's daughter. <laughs> but then the other one is. And this is, uh, well, that sometimes in mythology, <coughs> the mother is both the mother and the wife of yep. the child. Mm. Yep. Mm. Mm. <coughs> well, um, so I, I just want to, uh, so we're getting towards, well, we are actually past the end of our time, but um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone that attended tonight and um, I appreciate everyone's thoughts and you know, the contributions to the discussion, especially thank you to Brian uh, for partnering with me on uh, the goddess and Brian is hoping to, uh, holding up the book that, um, that we use tonight. It's the goddess power by uh, Isabella Price. Um, so if you, if you want to get that book, you can go right ahead. That's what that's where we're going to be following. Uh, if you have any suggestions about what you want to see or you know what you want to discuss, please uh, you can send me a message in Meetup uh, or Brian a message in Meetup and uh, or you know Sheree Khan a message in Meetup as well. And you could just um, thank you, Sheree Khan, and you could just let us know what you want to see. Uh, Brian, do you have any closing thoughts? Brian, I think you're on mute. Okay, the next goddess I'd like to do is Ocean. Ocean, O-S-H-U-N. She's from Africa, I think Nigeria. And the, uh, you know, before there was a place called Nigeria. And the, um, that will all, that will start bending your mind as to what goddesses can do. That uh, she's now very, as I understand it, a very popular god in uh, or goddess in uh, Brazil. <laughs> the thoughts I have are that number one, uh, the the point that David brought out right away, that um, a benefit of this series is simply to identify value. Uh, highlight uh, the feminine so that people will be more emboldened to speak from that space. And then the other one is with Joe, the uh, heroine's journey. It, it, it's so obvious to me now that he's asked the question that Isis and her uh, resurrection of Osiris is a hero's journey. And it, it, in fact, it's an amazing, the bravery, the initiative, the conception of it uh, is uh, phenomenal. It had, uh, according to the myth, it had political impacts, historic impacts, uh, religious impacts, because Osiris became king of the underworld, that it's really quite a remarkable hero's quest. That's my big takeaways. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Sherry Cox. Two quick, points. Two quick points. Uh, one, responding to David. Uh, different systems are different. Like, for example, in the Chinese system, when you go to uh, I Ching, uh, they have eight people 
They have the father, mother, the oldest son, middle son, little son. Then you have got the eldest daughter, middle daughter, and the youngest daughter. So you got eight, eight together, and you to work with all of them. Uh, so it's it's different, and I think here we're going to see how different cultures approach these uh, in different ways. Um, I think it's going to be fast. I'm very, very excited about this series, uh, Evan Eek and uh, Brian. So thank you. Thank you so much for doing it. Thank you. And oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and just a quick note, the next series uh, will be next month in August. I'm just going to pull up the calendar. That way I can give you the date. The, we said right now this is going to happen in the second Sunday of the month. Um, we'll let you know if anything needs to change. But so for the next series, it is going to be, I believe we said the 14th. It'll be August 14th. So um, we hope to see everyone th then. Um, if there are no more questions or comments, I will say have a great night, Sheree Kant. Thank you for letting me use your platform. Thank you for letting us use your platform to talk about this. Good night, everyone. Good night.